Okay, so we continue with the last talk in the control theory and optimization section with Rekha Thomas from Washington University, and she's going to talk about spectrahedral lifts of convex sets. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. So my talk is going to be on spectrahedral lifts of convex sets. And this is a slice of uh, the general landscape of trying to represent convex sets via projections. And that in itself is in the much bigger context of trying to find efficient representations for convex sets so that they can be used as input to algorithms that optimize over these sets. Okay, so that's the general idea. And let me start with two examples that hopefully illustrate why you might care about uh, good representations, and especially these types of representations. Okay, so my first example is a very famous example from combinatorial optimization. This is due to Latsilovas. And it starts with a graph, an undirected graph, G, on n vertices, 1 through n, with some edges. And if you recall, a set S inside the set of vertices is called stable or independent if any time you have two elements in the set, I and J, then the pair ij is not an edge, okay? So for example, in this picture, the orange to these two orange points, they form a stable set because no two elements are connected by an edge, okay? That's a stable set. And the stable set problem asks to find the biggest cardinality of a stable set inside the graph, okay? This is a problem with a lot of applications. It's NP-hard, and um, there is a standard way to model this geometrically. So what you do is you associate to every stable set its incidence vector, chi of s. So chi of s is a 0, 1 vector of size n. And in the ith position, it'll have 1 if i is in s, and it'll have 0 if i is not in s. Okay, so this is a, there's a bijection between the stable set and this incidence vector. And these 0, 1 points, let's just think of them as these orange points that you see over here. Okay, so this is a collection of 0, 1 points. And now the stable set problem is to find the orange point that has the most number of 1s in it, right? Now, if you think about this, these 0, 1 points are also the solutions to these quadratic equations. So xi square equal xi tells you that all the points have coordinate 0, 1 in every coordinate. And xi times xj equal to zero for every edge in the graph tells you that this really corresponds to a stable set, okay? It's not just any zero one point. So it's the solutions to these quadratic equations, and now we want to maximize the sum of the xi's over these, the solutions to this, these equations. And uh, so that's my objective function down here, and the best point is up here. That's what we're trying to find. But notice that because the objective is linear, we might as well just convexify all the points together and just maximize the sum of the xi over the polytope that you get by convexifying these incidence vectors together, okay? So this convex hull, it's a polytope. It's called the stable set polytope written as tab G, usually. And so in principle, this is a linear programming problem. We want to maximize a linear objective over a polytope, okay? But the trouble is that this polytope is extremely complicated and we don't really know a full description of this polytope in general. So the next best thing one might try is you might try to make an outer approximation of this polytope. Let's say if we can get a good outer approximation, then we optimize the linear objective over that thing and then hope that the answer is not too far from the original one. Okay, so that's the idea. And there's a very nice standard outer approximation of this that comes from semi-definite programming. So let me introduce one slide just exp that explains what is semi-definite programming. This is basically linear programming in the space of symmetric matrices. That's what it is. So we start with the positive semi-definite cone. Let's call it Sn plus. These are all the n by n real positive semi-definite matrices. So these are matrices whose eigenvalues are all non-negative. It's a convex closed cone inside the space of symmetric matrices. So here is my blue cone. That's the PSD cone. And then semi-definite programming just asks to maximize a linear function C dot X. So big X is now a matrix, unknown matrix, subject to affine linear equations. There's a bunch of them. And then X has to be positive semi-definite. This is usually the symbol for X being positive semi-definite. 
So geometrically, what we're doing is we're slicing this cone with an affine plane that's given by these equations, and then optimizing the linear function over that intersection. Okay? So the intersection of an affine plane with the semi-definite cone is called a spectrohedron. These are the feasible regions of semi-definite programs, and here are various pictures of spectrohedra, three-dimensional spectrohedra. Um, they are more complicated than polyhedra. Polyhedra are certainly spectrohedra, so they are more general than polyhedra. We know a bunch of things about them. They are convex, they are semi-algebraic, we know that all the extreme points are exposed and things like that. But we also do not know a lot of things about them. For instance, we do not know how to recognize a convex semi-algebraic set as a spectrohedron. We do not know many things about them. Okay? Anyway, so those are the feasible regions of spectrohedra. So now we can come back to the stable set polytope. And uh, there is a nice outer approximation of this polytope that's shown in this round uh, oval shape that was suggested by Lovas in 1979. Okay? So Lovas constructed this thing called the theta body of a graph, theta of G. And this is, this is defined like this. So it's the set of all X and Rn for which you can find a matrix U such that when you build this bigger matrix, this big matrix has size n plus 1 by n plus 1, where x is in the first row and also in the first column, we need this matrix to be positive semi-definite, and you need this u to satisfy certain linear conditions that comes from the stable set problem. Okay? So what these conditions are are not so important. What's important is to notice that this upstairs thing is a spectrohedron. So we are requiring positive semi-definiteness, and subject, there is some linear conditions or affine linear conditions that the matrix has to satisfy, okay? But we're not taking all of it, we are projecting back onto some of the coordinates, so this is really geometrically the projection of a spectrohedron, okay? So upstairs we build the spectrohedron using the x's and the u's, but downstairs when we project back onto the x's, you get a projected body, and that exactly is this thing that sits around the stable set pro uh, polytope, and that is this outer approximation that Lovas constructed. Okay, so why is this good? And the reason it's good is because semi-definite programs can be solved in polynomial time up to arbitrary precision. And therefore, if you have something that's the projection of a spectrohedron, then you can optimize downstairs by actually optimizing upstairs. So indirectly, you get this very nice algorithmic result that tells you that you can solve the a linear optimization problem over the theta body by indirectly solving it upstairs and therefore getting a polynomial time algorithm. So this is a very nice result. And of course, the best situation would be when the stable set polytope is exactly this theta body, because then when you solve downstairs, you actually get the, the, the you solve the stable set problem. And that also was shown in this paper of Lovas. He proves that the stable set polytope is the theta body if and only if the graph is perfect. Okay, so perfect graphs are those without odd holes, and um, this is a case where you get exactness. So in this case, of course, we get indirectly through this method, a polynomial time method, to find this, the biggest stable set in a, um, in a perfect graph. And even now, we do not know any other method. So this is the only method that's out there that gives you this nice algorithmic result. So this is an example of a spectrohedral lift. In the case of perfect graphs, the stable set polytope has a spectrohedral lift, and it has all these very, very nice consequences. Okay. So here's the next example. So this example is due to Ranestad and Strumpfels from 2010. And they considered this uh, space curve that's parametrized like this. So you take the curve cosine theta, sine 2 theta, cosine 3 theta. It's just a compact curve in R3. You can see a piece of it here in black. And then let's convexify it. Okay? So if you convexify it, you get this semi-algebraic set that you see sitting on the, on the side over here. And that set is called C. Okay, so it's very difficult in general to calculate the convex hull of an object like this. But in this case, it happens to have three pieces. There are two triangles, one on the top and one at the bottom that you can't see. There's a cubic surface that's this yellow surface. And then there is a degree 16 surface that is this green surface, and it has this equation. Okay, so that's the degree 16 surface that is part of this boundary. 
So it's extremely complicated. It's, ex it's complicated to calculate it even you know, directly, but in the end, it also has this very complicated expression. But on the other hand, it turns out that this body is the linear image of a spectrohedron, okay? So here, for instance, this is a Hermitian spectrohedron. You see the imaginary number i in it, but doesn't matter, it's the same idea. So this is the image, it, can be, it is the set of all x, y, z in R3, such that there exists a UVW that satisfies this PSD condition. So this is another reason for why you might care, right? To, to, to actually describe the object in its ambient space is usually very, very complicated. It's usually much easier to say it's the projection of something simple that lives in a bigger dimensional space, okay? So these are my two motivating examples of why you might care about uh, lifts in general. So this upstairs body is called the lift, but in this particular case, I'm using spectrohedral lifts because we know how to optimize over the PSD cone. Okay, so in general, you want to use some nice cones if you care about uh, algorithmic results. Okay, so now let's ask the very, very general question that you can ask in this context. You can say, suppose I'm given a convex set C in Rn, I'm also given a closed convex cone K in some other Euclidean space, M is bigger than N. Okay, so we have a, a cone and a set. I would like to know when is it true that the set is the linear image, so pi is a linear map, of the intersection of the cone with an affine space. Okay, so you have the cone, you're allowed to slice it and project it down uh, with a linear map. When is the set exactly this projection? Okay, this is the question. Um, here's a picture, so here is the square in the plane. It's the image of this a spectrohedron upstairs that's called the elliptope. This is the set of all correlation matrices, three by three correlation matrices. Um, in, uh, so this is an example of what I'm looking for, but really I'm not requiring the upstairs cone to be the PSD cone, I'm, it can be any closed convex cone. Okay, so take any closed convex cone and let's ask this question. So we looked at this question with uh, Joao Gouveia and Pablo Parillo, and you can answer this. And to answer this question, I need to tell you a, a little bit about a certain operator that plays a very big role in, this, in the answer, okay? So what you do is we introduce something called the slack operator of a convex set. So what it is, is it's an operator that goes from the extreme points of the set C cross the extreme points of the polar of the convex body, C polar. So C polar, if you remember, is the set of all Ys that make less or equal to one in a product with everything in C, okay? So you have this map that takes an extreme point in C and an extreme point in C polar and sends it to one minus the inner product of X and Y, okay? So from this definition that X, the inner product is less or equal to one, you see this is actually a non-negative number. So it's actually a map into R plus, not into R, but still, what Let's write it like this. This is the slack operator. And we say that the slack operator is K factorizable. So K is the cone that you're given. So SC is K factorizable. If I can find two maps, A and B, A should send every extreme point of C into the cone K, and B should send every extreme point of C polar into the dual cone K star, such that when you apply the slack operator to two extreme points, x and y, the answer should be the same as taking the inner product of ax with by, okay? So basically, we have this operator that's sending a pair of extreme points to a number, and I want to factor this, this operator through the cones. So I have this map A that sends x into the cone, a map B that sends y into the dual cone, and then when I take the inner product up there, I should get the same answer as applying the slack operator to the pair x, y. So this is what it means for the operator to, operator to factor through the cone. Okay, so, that's, so the cone and the set have come into play. So now the theorem is that C has a k-lift, meaning that C is the image, the linear image of a slice of k, if and only if this slack operator has a k-factorization. So for a general closed convex cone, the theorem is slightly more complicated, uh, but for all nice cones, and nice is a technical term actually in this context, such as the positive orthans or PSD cones and so on, this is exactly the theorem, okay? So C has a k-lift if and only if the slack operator has a k-factorization. So that's my first comment. Um, 
This theorem was inspired by a very beautiful theorem of Yanakakis that was proposed in 1991 about polyhedral lifts of polytopes, and I will talk about this theorem in a, in a couple of slides. So the, the basic ingredients are kind of, um, you know, from, it's it, it sort of inspired by his, his idea. And uh, the other comment I want to make is that, so in, in, the, in the optimization literature, there's a lot of lift and project methods that are based on positive orthons or the PSD cones. He has a lot of different references by many people who have introduced these methods. And what these methods do is that you want access to some set C, like the stable set polytope. But what we really have is some outer approximation of it, like Q. And then all these methods, what they do is they successively get you closer and closer to C. If it's a polytope, you'll actually hit C. And the way they get closer and closer is by slicing cones in a family and projecting down. So you keep on slicing cones in a family with affine planes, project down, and eventually the method gets you to C. So these are called lift and project methods, and all of these lift and project methods by this theorem should come with a factorization. So all of them have these factorizations that are guiding them. Okay. So let me do a very simple example so that you see the factorization in action. So this is a very simple one. So this is just the unit disk in the plane. And this is a very fancy way to write the unit disk in the plane. Right? So you take all x, y, and r2 such that this 2 by 2 matrix is PSD. So you can quickly check it. So PSD means that the diagonal entries have to be non-negative. So that tells you x is between minus 1 and 1. It also tells you that the 2 by 2 determinant is non-negative. And that's 1 minus x square minus y square. So it's not negative. Okay? So this is the unit disk. And this is trivially a spectrohedron, so it has like, it, it is a spectrohedron, so it has a trivial lift into S2 plus. It's uh, just trivially itself a spectrohedron. And here are the two operators. So A will send an extreme point on the boundary of, this, of the disk to this PSD matrix. B will send an extreme point on the boundary of the dual uh, of the polar, which is itself, to this other PSD matrix, and when you take the inner product, you will get exactly the, uh, the value of the slack operator. Okay? So it needs a little calculation, but you can check that this works. Okay? So this is, the, this is now a continuous, fact. I mean, it's a factorization, it's a, a kind of continuous map from the boundary of uh, the, the disk to, these, to the 2 by 2 PSD cone. Okay. So, let me spend now a couple slides on talking about polytopes. So that's a very special case of uh, the, the general theorem. And in the case of polytopes, uh, let's start by looking at the polytope like this. So let's assume that the polytope is x in Rn such that fx is less or equal to d. Okay, so f represents all the, so f has, the rows of f are all the facet normals and d is all the right-hand sides. Let's assume that there are V vertices in this polytope and F facets, okay? So now the extreme points, uh, so, so P is our convex set. So the extreme points are the vertices. There are only finitely many. The extreme points of the polar are the facets of the polytope, right? So really, we only have to look at the vertices and facets of the given polytope to get C and C polar, the extreme points of C and C polar. So now the slack operator really can be represented by a finite matrix. So we have a matrix whose rows are indexed by the vertices and whose columns are indexed by the facets. And then if you look at vertex VI and facet, the jth facet, so let's say the jth facet is this, then the slack, what the slack operator is doing is it's calculating the slack of this vertex in that facet inequality, meaning it's plugging in this vertex in the place of this x and just calculating the number that you get. So this is a non-negative number. It's the kind of the distance from the vertex to the facet. Okay? So not, not Euclidean distance, just this sort of distance. So this is a v by f matrix where v is the number of vertices, f is the number of facets. This is called the slack matrix of the polytope. Okay. So here's a simple example. So if we take the square, it has four vertices and four facets. So here we should get a four by four matrix. So if you plug in all the vertices into the corresponding linear polynomials here, you will see you will get something like this. 
Okay, so this is the slack matrix. It's a finite matrix. This operator is now finite. And um, if you want to factorize this slack matrix through the cone K, then what we have to do is we have to assign to every vertex a point in the cone, cone K, and we have to assign to every facet a bunch of points in the cone K star, such that, so A1 through AV will be assigned, will be, uh, assi these are elements of K that are assigned to the rows of this matrix. B1 through BF are elements of K star that are assigned to the columns of the matrix, so that when you take the inner product between AI and BJ, you get exactly the slack entry. The slack entry is DJ minus FJ transpose VI. Okay, so that's what it means to factorize this matrix. And then the theorem will just say that P has a K lift if and only if this matrix has a K factorization, okay? So this is the, this is a direct, the direct analog of the theorem that was proved by Yanakakis in 1991. He showed this theorem, he proved this theorem for the case where K is a positive orthand, okay? And he introduced this term slack matrix, and it's, it's very powerful. It's, it's a very canonical way to represent a polytope. It's basis-free. It just sort of measures the distance between vertices and facets, the slack, okay? This version of the theorem is also appears in the paper of Fiorini et al. from 2013, uh, where P is a polytope and K is an arbitrary cone, okay? So the, this, is, this is how the, the situation looks when you have a polytope. Okay, so here's a, a, a simple example again, just to illustrate the polytope case. So it's the same picture we saw before. So you have a square in, in R2 with vertices plus minus one. And this expression over here is telling us that this square has a PSD lift of size three. So I can write the square as the set of all X, Y, and R2 such that there exists a Z for which this matrix is positive semi-definite. Again, if you check the conditions of being positive semi-definite, you immediately get the inequalities of the square, okay? Um, we just saw that the slack matrix looks like this. This is a four by four matrix. So to factor it, so they, this lift tells you that there is a factorization into the three by three PSD cone. So I, need to, I, will, I should be able to assign uh, four PSD matrices to the rows of this matrix and four PSD matrices to the columns of this matrix, so that when you take the inner product of the ith one here and the jth one here, you get exactly the ij entry inside this matrix. So inner product in this space means that you take the product and take the trace. It's, the, it's a trace product, and um, also known as Frobenius product, and that's, that's exactly what you have to do in this situation. So this is an explicit factorization. Of course, there are many, many factorizations. There's a whole orbit of factorizations, um, and you can study the space of factorizations. It's actually very interesting, um, and uh, this is just one concrete example of a factorization. Okay, so this is, um, this is an example of a polytope with a spectrohedral lift. Okay. So now um, we can actually, so we've, we've answered the question of what happens, when is it that a cone has a lift into a, uh, sorry, a, a convex set has a lift into a cone C. But since we are focused on these spectrohedral lifts, which means that all the cones are all positive uh, semi-definite cones, you can actually ask for the smallest cone into which the set has a lift. Right, so positive semi-definite cones have the property that all their faces are again positive semi-definite cones of lower size. So if there is a lift that happens to just sit in a face of the cone, you can actually just go down to a smaller cone in the family and say, oh, it actually has a lift into the smaller element where it actually cuts through the interior, okay? So when you have closed families of cones like this, like positive orthans also have this property that their faces are again positive orthans, then you can, you can, um, create this notion of rank for the, for the convex set. So let's define the PSD rank of the convex set to be the minimum K such that C has a lift into the K by K PSD cone, okay? So by a theorem, that's the same thing as asking what is the minimum K such that this slack operator has a factorization through SK plus, right? The equivalent. So we could ask for this, and oftentimes this is useful because we don't want to lift into a, a cone that's unnecessarily too big. So we'd really like to know the smallest possible cone into which you can make the lift. 
Okay, so now, if you study convex sets in general, we don't know a lot about what, is, what are bounds on this PSD rank, okay? So let me talk about lower bounds on this slide. So here is a very nice result that was proven last year by uh, Hamza Fauzi and Mohab Safialdin. And they proved that the PSD rank of a convex set C is bounded below by the root of the logarithm of D, where D is the minimum degree of a polynomial that vanishes on the boundary of the polar. <laughs> okay? So it's a, it, it, there's a bunch of things here. But basically what you do is you go to the polar body, you find out the, the smallest degree of a polynomial that vanishes on the boundary of the polar, and that D, take its logarithm and root, it will be a lower bound on the PSD rank. Okay, this is their theorem. So this theorem helps you answer, so let's, let's think about what this means for a polytope. Okay, so for a polytope, the dual is the, the facets of the dual are given by the vertices of this polytope, right? So if you take the linear uh, polynomials that give you the facets of the dual, then the product of all those linear things together is a polynomial that vanishes on the boundary of the polar, right? And its degree is the number of vertices. So it tells you that the PSD rank of a, pol uh, of a polytope has to be at least as much as the root of the logarithm of the number of vertices, okay? So it tells you that even for polygons, if you, if you make polygons grow in the number of vertices, the PSD rank has to go up, right? It cannot be that just because you're looking at two-dimensional bodies, you can get away with using a cone that has a small size. So as the number of vertices goes up, the PSD rank will go up, okay? So this is something we did not know before, like how to control this with number of vertices, and their theorem actually shows you how to do it. Now, on the other hand, there's another theorem, which I kind of, well, Hamza and I kind of stumbled on this when we wrote the article for the proceedings to organize this material. It also turns out that the PSD rank is bounded below by root n. So n is the dimension of the convex set. And this gives you some other types of uh, useful examples. So in the case of a polygon, for instance, if you just take polygons, root n is always root 2. So this is not a useful result. The, the first one is. But there are other kinds of examples, like if you take the n square ball, okay, just the n square ball of radius 1, then it has a lift into the uh, PSD cone of size 2n. So it's a root n reduction. And it's not so easy to see that lift is optimal, but by this result it is. Okay, you cannot do better than root n, and we have something that's root n size, so if you have n square, you can go to n. Okay? Now, for things like the unit ball, the, the smallest degree of a polynomial that vanishes on the boundary of the dual is quadratic. It's a quadratic polynomial, so the first result doesn't help you, but the second result does. So right now we have these two types of dual results, and it would be really nice to get a result that combines D and N together, <laughs> right? So we don't have something like that. We don't quite understand how convex sets uh, grow in their PSD rank. Okay, but when we come to polytopes, a lot more is known about the lower bounds for PSD rank. So early on, we noticed, this is uh, Richard Robinson and Joao Gouveia Joa again, we noticed that the PSD rank of a polytope is always bounded below by n plus 1. So if you remember the Lovas construction, the, that was the stable set polytope of dimension n, and he constructed a PSD lift of size n plus 1. And this tells you that you cannot do better, right? You cannot go even smaller in the size of the PSD cone, so it was optimal. Um, but, of course, this is a very uh, low, uh, it's, a, it's a linear lower bound, not, not too exciting. So there are, there are some other very interesting results in this, in this realm. So in combinatorial optimization, for instance, people care a lot about 0-1 polytopes, polytopes that are convex hulls of 0-1 points. And this, this results by Briad, Dadush, and Pokuta says that for any n, you can always find a subset of 0-1 points such that when you convexify and take the PSD rank, it's big, okay? So there are big, uh, there are 0-1 polytopes with big PSD rank, but they didn't actually find one. They, it's a counting argument. They say that there has to exist one of these polytopes in every n. 
And the, the big breakthrough for actually finding one is due to Lee, Stoyer, and Raghavendra from 2015, where they show that uh, for, for every N, there is some stable set polytope or cut polytope or TSP polytope. They give you different types of polytopes for which the PS3 rank is bounded below exponentially by N. Okay? So for polytopes, this is sort of the, it's a much more advanced story than for convex sets. Um, this is what we know. It would be interesting to find an example of a polytope over which we know how to optimize in polynomial time for which the lift is still very, very big and we do not know such an example. Okay, so let me, on the other hand, so those are all bad examples in the sense of PSD rank being very high, but because of this first theorem on this slide, we also know that the PSD rank is bounded below by n plus one, and maybe you can ask, okay, what are the polytopes whose PSD rank is exactly n plus one? This is also interesting because these are the ones with small PSD lifts and we can hope to do something good with them. So we have a bunch of results on this, on characterizing these PSD minimal polytopes, that's what we call them. So in the, in the plane, for instance, there are only two, triangles and quadrilaterals are PSD minimal. So this notion of PSD rank is invariant under polarity, it's also invariant under projective transformations. So when I write quadrilateral and square, I really mean you can make any projective transformations of these, so basically any quadrilateral is okay, any triangle is okay. Okay, so the entire combinatorial class is PSD minimal. In dimension three, it gets more interesting. So there are, the, the, there are some uh, easy ones, like the simplex, the bisimplex, the quadrilateral prism, triangular prism. So this is polarity invariant, so anytime you get one, you also get the polar for free. So these first four things, they are PSD minimal no matter what the embedding is. So it's the entire combinatorial class is PSD minimal. But then you get to two interesting examples. So the, this is the octahedron and the cube, which are dual to each other. These are not always PSD minimal. So now it really depends on the embedding. So this is a geometric property. And it's kind of easy to see what the geometric property is. In the case of the octahedron, it really is that the four, vert the four vertices that go in a ring, uh, there are three of them, right, that go in a ring. Those two of them have to be on a plane. Okay, so we call these biplane octahedra, and so there is a, the, the moral is there is some geometric condition in addition to the combinatorics. Um, the, let's come back to the stable set polytope for a moment. So now that we are allowing any kind of PSD lift, not just the, the one that Lovas proposed, you can ask, well, are there more graphs for which the stable set polytope is PSD minimal? Maybe not just perfect graphs, because his construction was very specific, but now we're allowing any type of PSD lift. And again, the, the, the result of LOVAS is optimal in the sense that you cannot catch any more graphs by, um, uh, by PSD lifts of this very, very small size. So the stable set polytope is PSD minimal if and only if G is perfect. Now, dimension four, we resisted for a long time, but then we finally attempted dimension four. Dimension four is very complicated already. There are 31 combinatorial classes of polytopes that contribute PSD minimal uh, polytopes. Um, 11 of these are combinatorially PSD minimal, meaning no matter what they're embedding, they're PSD minimal. And kind of miraculously, those 11 are exactly the 11 known projectively unique polytopes in dimension four by McMullen and Shepard, okay? So there is a, a connection between projective uniqueness and this theory, or more generally, there's a certain ideal that comes out of this um, that we've explored in some later papers. I won't talk about that. But those 11 are completely combinatorially PSD minimal, but in the rest, in the other 20, classes, you have conditions. You have basically varieties. You can tell which loci you know, will correspond to PSD minimal polytopes. So we can completely do that. Dimension five looks pretty hopeless. But of course, there are families of polytopes in all dimensions that are PSD minimal as well, like cubes. Okay. So let me get, uh, sort of spend the last 10 minutes or so um, talking a little bit more about specific constructions for making PSD lifts. So the constructions so far were just abstract constructions. They, they exist or they don't exist. Um, so here's a very specific one. 
Um, these are basically generalizing the idea of Lovas's construction for the stable set polytope. So we call these uh, theta bodies of an ideal, and this is uh, joint work with Gouveia and Parillo. And here what we do is we start with an ideal. So we start with some M polynomials, and you look at the ideal of these polynomials. And what we really want to look at is the real variety of these polynomials. So look at the real solutions of these polynomials. Let's call it V of I. Okay. So suppose we're interested in convexifying this real variety, just like we convexified the space curve up front. So let's convexify and take the closure. Then, as you know, what this convex hull is, it's simply the intersection of all x's such that Lx is non-negative on this variety, so non-negative on the variety, and L is linear. So this is a little movie that unfortunately doesn't play because it's not a Mac, but uh, basically it would have convexified this, this cardioid and you would have seen all the tangents coming together and it'll remove this little kink and put a, tan a bitangent over here. Okay, anyway. So that's what it is. So if we knew all the linear inequalities that are non-negative on your variety, then, that, then we know the convex hull. That's the moral. Um, now, how do, you sp how do you certify non-negativity on a variety? So you don't want to certify non-negativity everywhere. We just want it on this variety. And the point is that you can do this using sums of squares, but modulo the ideal. So for example, let me just illustrate on an example. So suppose I want to show that this blue line is non-negative on this red circle. Then here's the equation of the blue line. It's 1 minus y. And uh, it's 1 minus y is greater or equal to 0. That's what we're trying to show. So 1 minus y can be written as this sum of squares, square plus square, plus something that comes from the ideal, meaning something that's a multiple of the equation of the circle. So now if I plug in a red point into the right-hand side, it'll disappear here because it's coming from the circle. It's non-negative on the squares, so the right-hand side is non-negative, therefore the left-hand side is non-negative. So this is the technique for writing, uh, certifying non-negativity on a variety. So if we <coughs> have that observation, then what we can do is instead of taking the linear polynomials that are non-negative on the variety, let's just take the ones that are sums of squares modulo the ideal, okay? So of course this may be a bigger set because maybe not everything that's non-negative is actually a sum of squares, so you, only, you get an inclusion like this, okay? But still, let's run with this. And now we can define the general kth theta body, okay? So the general kth theta body of the ideal is going to be all the x and rn such that a linear polynomial Lx is non-negative and it is SOS mod the ideal, it's a sum of squares, but I'm going to restrict the degree of the polynomials I'm allowed to square to be k, okay? So I don't allow any arbitrary polynomials to be squared, but I want the sums of squares to be coming from polynomials of degree k, okay? So that's the kth theta body. And of course, this will create a nested sequence that will contain the true convex hull. So this is theta one, the first theta body. This actually coincides with Lovas's construction for the polynomial system that I had on the first slide. And then you can get the second, the third, and so on, and you hope that as you catch more and more linear um, polynomials, because you're increasing the degree of the sum of squares, you will actually get to the convex hull. So here's a simple example. So if you take the real variety of these two polynomials, you get these two black rings that look like rubber bands, okay, two black rings. If you take the first theta body, you get this egg-like structure. It's not the convex hull. You can clearly see it's bigger than the convex hull. That's the first theta body. If you do the second theta body, you can't quite see the rings anymore, but you actually get the actual convex hull. So the second theta body is already the convex hull, and that's what these constructions are doing. Okay, so they're catching more and more linear polynomials that are non-negative on the variety, but by increasing the degree. So this is essentially the Lasser or SOS hierarchy that you, we heard about yesterday, except that all the calculations are more than ideal. And if your variety was finite, this idea is also in a paper of Monique Laurent before we did this work, but this basically extends uh, it to any arbitrary ideal and real variety. Okay, so these are theta bodies. Okay, so the first theorem is that, well, it's a consequence of the construction that these theta bodies are really projections of spectrohedra. 
questions, okay? So here's a simple example, so, which means that they can be, it also means that they can be described explicitly. So here's a very, very, very trivial example just to show you the pictures, how these things look. So let's say we take this ideal, this univariate ideal with three zeros, right? It has zeros minus one, zero, and plus one. And suppose I wanted to convexify that. So we're basically trying to write the interval minus one, one <laughs> with a spectrohedron, okay? I have to choose something this trivial, otherwise you can't see the upstairs and the downstairs at the same time, okay? So let's do it. If you, construct the, if you try to construct the first theta body upstairs, you get this parabola. And if you project it back down, you get the entire real line. So you don't get anything interesting, okay? If you construct the second theta body, the upstairs you already get a compact spectrohedron. When you project back down, you get almost minus one one. There's a little bit jutting out on this side. Okay, it's not quite minus one one. If you go to the third theta body, you get exactly minus one one. Okay, so this is what's happening. It's sort of uh, uh, sequentially getting closer and closer to the true convex hull by building spectrohedra upstairs and projecting downstairs. So this is the geometry. But this immediately tells you that there has to be a factorization that goes with this construction, right? So in the kth theta body, if that equals the convex hull, then there has to be this A map and B map that's going to tell you how to factorize the, the slack operator. And in this case, the factorization is extremely special. So I just want to point out what that is. So what the A map is doing is that it's taking every point x in the, in the extreme point, uh, every extreme point on the, on the boundary of this convex hull, and it is sending it to a matrix that's constructed like this. So take all the monomials of degree at most k in the, in the number of variables you have, which is n, and then for, make a long vector with those monomials and multiply it with the transpose of that same vector. So you get a matrix and then evaluate that at this particular x. Okay, so this is a rank one matrix. It's lifting the boundary point to a rank one matrix. And on the B side, what it's doing is it's taking a linear functional and sending it to a PSD matrix such that this linear functional is this particular sum of squares modulo the ideal. So it's actually certifying the non-negativity of the linear functional uh, with a sum of squares. So this is exactly the factorization that's happening in the theta construction. So it's a very special factorization. Of course, we allowed arbitrary types of factorization, so you allowed crazy lifts, but uh, this is a very systematic one that will um, actually get you to the end. Um, at, well, not always to the end if you have an arbitrary variety, but if you have finitely many points, definitely it'll get you to the end. Okay. So let me finish the talk with this very famous question that was open for a good long time. So in the ICM in 2006, Nemirovsky uh, wrote an article and, um, and, and gave a talk. And he asked this question, do all convex semi-algebraic sets have spectrohedral lifts? Okay, so if you have a spectrohedral lift, then the projection has to be convex and has to be semi-algebraic. So, so the convexity is just because convex set is projecting to convex set. Uh, semi-algebraicity is because of Tarski's principle. So if you have a semi-algebraic set upstairs and you project it, it'll stay se semi-algebraic. So it's very natural to ask, is it true that all convex semi-algebraic sets have a spectrohedral lift? Okay, maybe a big one, but does it? Um, this question was worked on quite a lot by Helton and Nee, um, and they showed in 2009, 2010 that yes, it's true if the boundary of your set is sufficiently smooth and has positive curvature. So most of the time it's true. If you generically construct one, it's true. But this was actually disproved this year, last year, appeared this year by Klaus Scheiderer, and he shows many, many examples of uh, convex semi-algebraic sets that do not have spectrohedral lifts. And he has a whole theory that gives you a, a necessary and sufficient condition for the existence of a spectrohedral lift. But let me actually just give you a very concrete example that shows uh, 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 of something that does not have a spectrohedral lift. So this is just one little example in his paper. And so for instance, let's take n to be two, so that's the dimension we're working with, and let's take d to be at least six and take all the monomials, all the non-constant monomials in two variables of degree at most d. So there's a lot of them, okay? 
Now take any semi-algebraic set in the plane, S, and let's map every point in the semi-algebraic set to this vector. So you evaluate each of these monomials at every point in the set, okay? So this is called the Veronese map in, in, in algebraic geometry. So you map this set S via these monomials to some high dimensional space, take the convex hull, and that object will not have a spectrohedral lift, okay? So in general, he, this is a, a, a one example in a big family of examples. He has other types of examples as well, and uh, this um, answered negatively this helton knee conjecture, which had been open for a good long time. Um, and there are some interesting open problems here. The smallest counterexample is an R11, and we don't know. And in the plane, Scheiderot showed some years ago, it's true. helton knee conjecture is true in the plane. If you take any convex semi-algebraic set in the plane, it does have a spectrohedral lift. So we do not know what happens between R3 and R10, or R11, okay? All right, so I will end there. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, for, for this beautiful talk. Thank you. Somebody has a question? Uh, sorry. Uh, do you know which graphs uh, have the theta th their theta bodies as actually spectrohedron? So you know that they always lift a spectrohedron, but which are, uh, for which graph theta body is actually a spectrohedron? Oh, the theta body yeah, itself? Theta, yes, the theta body itself. Oh. I don't know. Um, certainly, if it, when it converges, <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know that. Okay, and uh, another question is, uh, in your construction, when you uh, prove this criterion, when uh, you can, when convex body admits a K lifting, uh, can you realize this map that maps uh, extremal points of your convex body? to a point in your yes, by yeah. section of your projection, which is also linear. So the, the proof is constructive, oh, so you can actually see the map. And it's a section of the projection. It's a section. I mean, section, I mean, it's like a in partial inverse of your. Linear. Yes, okay. so yeah, it's a partial inverse. So every point does get mapped upstairs, but okay. there's a whole fiber of things that get of mapped course, downstairs, course, right? Okay. But yeah, so in that section okay. in the algebraic geometry so sense, it, it yes. Leaves, it leaves as a. Yes, okay. it, but it's a complicated map. It's, it can be highly nonlinear. It, it's uh, it's not, certainly not a linear map that's going upstairs. Yeah, so the proof is constructive. It tells you the, where to send it. Another question, comment? No, so we'll find the speaker again. Please.